Hey everyone, this is Charles, and I want to welcome you to this replay of a recent live event we had, which was an ethical hacking live quiz. We used a live quiz platform with live attendees to let them test themselves on ethical hacking topics and compete in a quiz environment. So if you're watching this, I assume you may have some interest in ethical hacking. If that's the case, I would love to invite you to join my ethical hacking live course. It's a two week 15 hour live session where we walk through CEH version 11 topics. If you want to learn more about that, or if you want to sign up, you can find a link in the video description and here on screen that will give you access to a very special discounted offer for a limited time. Regardless, I hope you enjoy this replay of our ethical hacking live quiz. Hey everybody, welcome, welcome. Glad to see everybody here. My name is Charles Judd. If we haven't got the opportunity to be together in a live class, it's my pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Uh, and we're gonna go through some ethical hacking topics. Uh, we've done several of these online quizzes, these quiz events in the past, and they seem to be super well received. People seem to enjoy those. So I thought it'd be a great time to just throw one of those out there. Um, I recently had completed a professional ethical hacking course here on our platform. And uh, a lot of times when we make new training, we love to throw out some quizzes for those and just test everyone's knowledge. So if you haven't gotten a chance to jump in there just yet, um, you can find the link uh, on the video page. And uh, you can also see if you go to ahaslides.com forward slash KWT, that will allow you to uh, jump in and join, play along. Um, probably one of the best ways to do that is maybe on your mobile phone. You can open it on your mobile phone and still have your live stream in the background, uh, or you can open that in a new browser window, whatever seems best for you. So uh, hopefully uh, everything will work well for us today as far as the delay goes with YouTube Live. I think we've got that dialed in pretty well. I do see some players still jumping on to join the quiz. So we'll give them just a few more moments to get on board with us. Uh, again, welcome. So glad that you're here. Uh, I will go ahead and switch over to my quiz graphic now. So one more time before we jump on board, you can see the URL at the top, ahaslides.com forward slash KWT. And once you go to that page, it'll just ask you for some sort of nickname or your name, and then you could jump on board and join along. So as people are just kind of finalizing and jumping on board, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to get started. Uh, if you decide to jump in later at any point in the quiz, you can certainly do that. Uh, but just know you'll be a little bit behind everybody. So the way this works is we're going to have about 25 different questions. Uh, you'll have about 40 seconds for each question to answer that. And the faster you answer, the more points that you're going to get. So the faster you can get that answer in, the higher your point totals will be. And as the timer ticks away, your points will dwindle down. Uh, in typical quiz fashion, if you've done that, maybe at somewhere like Buffalo Wild Wings or something like that. And we'll show some leaderboards throughout the day just to see for bragging rights, who's out in front. So let's go back to our quiz platform here and let's get started. Let's get going with our quiz. We'll get started here with our first question. Question number one. Again, the faster you answer, the more points you get. Which port range encompasses registered ports assigned to specific protocols or applications? We can see those port ranges at the bottom. Again, we're going to start out with some fairly more basic topics here. Is it port range 0 through 1023? Is it 1024 through 49151? 49151 through 65534? Or 65535 through 89354? About five seconds remaining. And it looks like our time is up and we can see the correct answers here. So a little bit of a discrepancy here. We're looking for registered ports, port number zero through 1023 are what we call well-known ports. Port numbers 1024 through 49151, according to the ethical hacking 
blueprints is what we call registered ports. These are ports that are uh, called by several names. You may hear them referred to as dynamic ports or private ports, ephemeral ports. So these registered ports are network ports that are designated for use specifically with certain protocols or applications. So great job there. Let's move on now to question number two. Question number two. Which common Linux command is used to access restricted files and operations? Is it ls, pwd, cat, or sudo? Linux is a super popular platform when it comes to ethical hacking. Just a few more seconds. Let's check our answer here. And the answer is, in fact, sudo. So sudo is short for super user do. Uh, I see some people on the chat roll side jumping in with answers as well. Absolutely correct over there. Uh, so this sudo command enables us to perform tasks where we require administrative privileges or root permissions. Uh, it's not really advisable to use the command for daily use. You don't want to run that for everything that you do because it's very easy to make an error and maybe do something that you didn't intend necessarily to do. So uh, not a good practice to use it all the time. Uh, only use that when you need it. So great job there. We're going to take a peek here at our current leaderboard, and let's see what we've got at the moment. And just edging out looks like R by three points. So lots of time left. Lots of things can happen. Let's move on to the next question here. Question number three. Which Linux command will display the contents of a file inside of the terminal? Is it cat, touch, chmod, or cd? All fairly well-known Linux commands that we might use on a daily basis. About five seconds left. And it looks like the majority thinks it's cat. It is indeed cat, which is short for concatenate. Uh, that's used to list the contents of a file on the standard output directly in our terminal. Uh, so to run that command, we would just type cat followed by the file name and its extension. So if we're looking at just a simple text file, maybe it's named file.txt, we would just say cat file.txt, and we would be able to see the contents of that text file right in our terminal. So great job there. The majority got that one correct. Next. Up. Let's check out our next question. Which category of attack is carried out by an actor with legitimate access to a target system or network? Is it a passive attack, an active attack, a close in attack, or an insider attack? About 10 seconds left. And it looks like our time is up. Let's see the answer. And the majority looks like they chose insider attack. Absolutely correct. 
Insider attacks are when we have we have a legitimate user, uh, maybe an internal employee. Uh, they're using their legitimate access and their legitimate credentials to interact with the network in some sort of malicious fashion. So uh, typically, uh, what they're doing is maybe transferring confidential information out uh, to an external source or an external network. So uh, generally speaking, we're talking about the theft of uh, actual, could be physical devices, uh, or more commonly, it's data itself. Uh, that is as opposed to close-in attacks, which uh, sounds like it might be correct, but close-in attacks actually re rely on the physical proximity of the network. So instead of attacking the network from outside, we're actually really close to doing that, uh, typically in terms of social engineering. So great job there. Uh, I see a couple of questions here, uh, some folks rolling in late asking, how do they get access? So if you look at the top of the screen here, you can see the link ahaslides.com forward slash KWT. You can access that on your mobile phone or in any browser. You don't need a standalone app. Just go to that website in a browser and you can join in on the quiz. All right, next question. Let's see what we've got here. Question number five. Which phase in the cyber kill chain involves specifically tailoring an attack, sometimes through mock environments that would mirror the target? Is it reconnaissance, weaponization, exploitation, or delivery? So if you're familiar with the cyber kill chain, you know there are several phases to that. About five seconds left. And that was a tough one. Yeah, we've got answers kind of spread across the board here. Uh, that, that was tough. Uh, the cyber kill chain may be a, a foreign concept to you, certainly something that relates to ethical hacking. So the correct answer is weaponization. Weaponization is the second phase where an attacker has already performed some reconnaissance, they've identified a target, uh, and then they're beginning to tailor a specific attack. Um, and this phase also involves lots of trial and error. And one of the things that they might do is they, after they've performed reconnaissance, they might set up a mock lab that would model the target exactly with operating systems, uh, various, uh, the same kinds of system versions running, uh, same software running so that they can test out their attack methods without actually touching the actual target. So that's the weaponization phase. Let's take another look at our leaderboard here. And looks like Jonathan has moved up into position number one. Let me get my face off the screen so that we can see that a bit better. So great job there. Again, still lots of time left. The quicker you answer, the more points you get. Let's move on to the next question. Question number six. When performing a penetration assessment, which type of footprinting involves interacting with a target directly? Is it active, passive, scanning, or direct? Another fairly tough one here. We've got about five seconds left. And let's see what we ended up with. Looks like the majority got that one correct. The correct answer is in fact active. Active footprinting means we are directly interacting with a target. So that is as opposed to passive footprinting where we're not directly interacting. We're, when we're doing passive reconnaissance, maybe we're leveraging online resources, we're not touching the target in any way. But when we're actively footprinting, we are interacting with that. And we need to be more careful when we do that uh, because we can potentially set off alerts and alarms. So 
as ethical hackers, as penetration assessment professionals, why would we be concerned with setting off alarms? Well, that's one of the things that we're testing when we're performing an assessment. We're, we're trying to see if we can circumvent any alarms that might be in place and if there are even any alarms in place. Now, obviously, we have permission to perform testing, but we're trying to test everything possible. We want to see if any alarms are going to be thrown up. So uh, some of the things that we might do with active footprinting, we may perform ping sweeps. We may attempt to discover DNS information. We may be looking for internal email addresses, trying to map out the physical network and those types of things. So great job there. The majority got that one correct. Question number seven, which type of social engineering attack involves sending targeted email campaigns to high profile employees? Is it phishing? Spear phishing, whaling, or baiting? And pretty spread around on that one as well. That was a little tricky as well. So lots of these terms are very similar, right? Uh, and the correct answer is, of course, whaling. The, the relevant term here being high-profile employees. That's what makes it whaling. So when we're talking about phishing, phishing is, of course, when we send fraudulent emails while we're maybe posing as a legitimate institution. Spear phishing is more targeted where maybe uh, we have the same goals as a normal phishing campaign, but rather than sending out mass emails to random users, we would limit the scope maybe to specific individuals or groups. And then an even smaller subset of spear phishing is whaling. It's even more targeted where we're looking for high profile employees. Uh, sometimes we refer to these as C-level employees. It could be CEO, CFI, uh, pardon me, CFO, CIO. Uh, so we're looking for high level employees. And the reason we call it whaling is because if we can capture one of those types of employees, then we've probably made a really huge catch. If we've captured an, a corporate employee because the hopes are that they'll have more access than the typical user. So that's why we refer to that as whaling. All right, let's take a look at our leaderboard. And we've got some more movement here. Looks like Marco has jumped up to the top. So there's a look at the top five or six. Great job to everybody so far. Let's move on to our next question. Question number eight. A little more tricky here, a little more in-depth. Which in-map command allows us to scan specifically against the IP address 10.1.1.50 for SSH access? And you can see the different in-map commands with various flags inside of those at the bottom. I won't go through all of those. I won't bother to read over all those, but you can see those outputs at the bottom. Which one of those is correct? And looks like the time is up. Let's see. And great job there. Looks like most folks got that correct as well. So we see the nmap command. All of those start with nmap. Nmap, super popular tool when it comes to penetration testing. Uh, but this command has the dash p flag. Dash p indicates a specific port that we want to scan against. In this case, the port number is 22 for SSH. So we're checking to see if this port is open. The first option, the dash P dash flag, slightly different. That's going to scan for all open ports throughout the entire port range. And then we have the dash capital A flag. That's going to perform an aggressive scan for really in-depth information 
And then we have the dash SV flag. That's what we use to detect service versions running on the target. So great job there. We'll move on to the next question. Question number nine. Which nmap command allows us to perform a TCP send scan against an IP address of 10.1.1.50? Again, I won't read through all those commands, but you can see all of those. Which of those allows for a TCP send scan? And it looks like the answers are all in. And there we go. So we see the correct solution. That one, again, very tricky. Um, SIN is not a valid command, as we see there. The dash SP flag, the second option, says only perform a ping scan. Then we have dash PE which will perform an ICMP echo scan only. And then we have the dash PS flag. So uh, remember TCP involves a three-way handshake. So the SIN is one part of that handshake. And what this is going to do, NMAP supports a scanning technique called a TCP SIN ping scan. And that's going to send a SIN request at a given place, uh, at a given port on the target host. And if that port is open, then the target host is going to respond with a TCP send ACK packet indicating that a connection can be established. And why would we want to do that? Well, uh, it's very common for many network administrators to actually block ICMP ping messages. So an ordinary ping sweep or a ping scan from NMAP, that wouldn't work because it would be blocked because it just uses typical ICMP to be able to determine if the host is online. Uh, but this is an option that would allow us to get through a particular firewall like that. All right, let's take a look at our next one. Question number 10. Which of the following tools included with Kali Linux and Parrot OS is a dedicated brute force login cracker? Is it Hydra? Is it Burp Suite? Is it beef or is it Armitage? Again, a couple of very popular things that we use as penetration testers. Both of those operating system platforms are super, super popular. And it looks like the majority got that one correct. It is, in fact, Hydra. Hydra is a pre-installed tool that we find in Kali Linux and Parrot OS security. Uh, and that's used to brute force username and password combinations to all kinds of different services. Could be FTP, could be SSH, could be Telnet. Uh, MS SQL, you name it. So uh, brute force uh, can be used to try all kinds of different usernames and passwords in an automated manner, trying lists of credentials. So uh, let's talk about the other options. Burp Suite, another super popular and powerful tool, uh, but it's really more of an all-in-one vulnerability testing tool. Beef, which is short for the browser exploitation framework, uh, that is a penetration testing tool that focuses on the web browser. And Armitage is a GUI front end for Metasploit, which is an exploitation framework that is also built into those operating systems. All right, we'll take a look now at our leaderboard once again, see what we've got going here. And it looks like Jonathan has jumped back to the top, taking over the lead once again. Give you a quick look at the first five or six. So great job there, everybody. 
on to our next question. Question number 11. Which general category of tool does brute spray fall under? Enumeration, exploitation, reconnaissance, or password attacks? And our time is up. Let's check our answer. Password attacks is the majority, and password attacks is correct. Brute Spray is uh, runs as a Python script, and it provides uh, actually a combination of port scanning and automated brute force attacks against scanned services. So it will attempt default credentials to try and gain access. All right, next question. Which method involves using an automated means of injecting known compromised credentials into a login. Dictionary attack? Is it a credential stuffing attack? A key logging attack? Or a man in the middle attack? And we have just about five seconds remaining. And it looks like the majority chose credential stuffing attack, which is absolutely correct. So credential stuffing attacks are when we have an automated means of stuffing or injecting username and password combinations into a login. So we're trying to gain access. So this is a type of brute force attack category. So. Uh, those are most commonly built from databases of known compromised credentials. Uh, those are uh, credentials, in other words, that may have been leaked out in some sort of data breach, uh, may be spilled uh, by legitimate users. So that's what we use as a credential stuffing attack. Another quick look at our leaderboard here. We'll see who has shuffled around any. And Brent, looks like Brent has jumped to the top of our leaderboard. Great job, everybody. On to our next question here. Question number 13. Which type of vulnerability is the top rated danger for modern web applications according to OWASP? OWASP being the Open Web Application Security Project. Injection, security logging and monitoring failures, broken access control, or security misconfiguration. All of those are definitely vulnerabilities that we find in the OWASP top 10, but one is the top rated danger for modern web applications. And our time is up. Let's see what we've got here. A, a bit of a tough one. Uh, broken access control. I saw someone in the chat called it out and got it correct. So uh, in the older version, the previously released version of the OWASP top 10, this was actually number five, but it's jumped all the way up to the top position. 94% of applications were tested with some sort of broken access control. And when we say access control, it means... That's used to enforce policies to make sure our users can't act outside of their intended permissions. So things like the privilege of least principle, uh, those are things that are being broken with our web application. So a huge danger there. All right, next question. Which type of SQL injection attack 
involves sending data payloads to a server in order to observe the response and behavior. Is it a blind SQL injection, an error-based SQL injection, a union-based SQL injection, or an in-band SQL injection? And our time is up. Let's see the answer. And it looks like the majority has it. It is, in fact, a blind SQL injection. So with a blind SQL injection, um, an attacker would not be able to see the result of an attack while they're in band. Uh, and that's why we call them blind SQL injections. The attacker, what they're uh, the only thing they're able to do is trying to inject commands into the database. Uh, nothing is returned back to them specifically, but they instead will observe the web application's response, the web application's behavior, and try to infer information about the database. So that's called a blind SQL injection attack, also referred to as an inferential SQL injection attack, because again, we are trying to infer information about the database. All right, next question. Question number 15, which type of attack is leveraged against physical processes and machinery? Is it a physical attack, a cloud attack, an IOT attack, or an OT attack? And time is almost up. That was certainly a tricky one. The correct answer is OT attack. Maybe something you've never heard about if you're not familiar with CEH topics or ethical hacking. OT is, it sounds like maybe a made up term because it's very close to IT, but OT is much older than IT. OT is short for operational technology. And again, the concept of OT actually predates the concept of IT. And that was historically just mechanical in nature. We're talking about mechanical systems, uh, things like the manufacturing industry, uh, transportation, utilities, things of that nature. The, even the healthcare industry use OT systems. And one of the biggest issues facing OT systems is the fact that they're often very outdated, especially when it comes to their digital infrastructure. Uh, if you think of, I, I live here in the United States, and something that I hear very commonly is that our common utilities, like our power and our water systems, uh, I, I've heard over and over again that many of these are running legacy systems that are somewhat vulnerable, and it could be, but they're you know extremely costly to update, so they haven't necessarily been updated, uh, and that creates a situation where you see attackers more and more frequently begin to probe around those OT systems looking for vulnerable infrastructure. So OT is operational technology. Again, that involves uh, physical processes and machinery. Um, so a, a bit of a probably a new topic unless you know about ethical hacking and specific, uh, specifically CEH. So uh, a bit of a tricky one there. Let's go ahead and take a look at our leaderboard once again. And it looks like Brent is still just edging out for the lead. So plenty of time left for that to shift around. Great job there, everybody. Let's move on to our next question. Question number 16. Within cryptography, what is the main way that we assure confidentiality within our networks and systems? Is it hashing? Encryption? redundancy, or passwords.
and time is almost up. And yeah, you guys nailed that one. A little more of a general security topic there, something that's still relevant to ethical hacking, but uh, one of the most foundational concepts in security is the CIA triad. Uh, the very important pillars of security that we are trying to protect, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Uh, every organization has assets that need to be protected. Assets are anything that are valuable. And one of the way, uh, main ways that we assure confidentiality is, in fact, through encryption. That could be local disk encryption. It could be TLS, or it could be VPN tunnels. Lots of ways that we can do that. So I see some folks in the chat who got that correct as well, who are playing along in the chat room. So great job there. Let's go on to our next question on the docket. Question number 17. Which type of cryptographic attack would involve having access to ciphertext and their associated plain text values? Is it a chosen plain text attack? Is it a known plain text attack? Is it a dictionary attack? Or is it an adaptive chosen plain text attack? Another somewhat tricky one. And our time is up. Yeah, you guys got it. Great job there. The majority has known plain text attack. All of these are categories of ciphertext attacks that are relevant to CEH. Uh, uh, known plain text attacks, what we call KPAs. This is where an attacker would have access to not only the ciphertext, but also the plain text. So they would be, uh, be able to map out the values and figure out what the ciphertext means. Now, our modern ciphers are generally considered to be really resistant to these types of attacks, but, uh, and they address issues with that by adding things like secret keys to the encryption. But uh, an example of that, if you're familiar with the old PKZIP encryption method, really old method, uh, that used legacy algorithms to create encrypted zip files. And by having an unencrypted file along with the original encrypted file, you could easily figure out the secret key being used. So again, not a really easy, relatively easy attack to perform when you have the ciphertext and the plain text both. But again, not very common with modern encryption, but something that you want to know about from a historical perspective. Let's take a look at our leaderboard. And it looks like Marco is up near the top now. Take a quick look at all of our leaderboard here on the top six or so. Great job. Let's move on to the next question. Which of the following is not a method for maintaining access to a target system? Enumeration, task scheduling, backdoor, or user creation? About five seconds left. And we can see the answers were fairly split across the board on that one. Um, one of the, uh, the, the, the one method that is not a method specifically for maintaining access is enumeration. One of the most common ways we do it is through a back door. We see that as one of our options. A back door is a tool that gives us easy access into a system. Uh, we also, uh, there are also uh, lots more ways uh, of specific ways to maintain access, especially if we can maintain uh, remote code execution 
or shell access. Uh, one of the ways that we can do that during a reboot is to create a new user account on the system. Uh, something else we can do is maybe to use task scheduling. Task uh, scheduling is available in many operating systems. Uh, and so if we have a command or a script that we're running that can give us access, we can schedule that to automatically run anytime the system is rebooted. So it ensures that we have constant access to that. And that allows us to basically pick up where we left off. That's one way that an attacker can embed themselves into a system. Now, from the perspective of ethical hacking, not really something we would do. We're not, we're not really concerned with maintaining access ourselves, but we do want to test, for instances, where that's possible and recommend remediation. So, all right, let's move on to the next question here. Which type of cross-site scripting injection attack is used to insert malicious content into a target application in a more permanent manner? Is it reflected XSS, non-persistent, DOM-based, or stored? And we see our answers coming in as time is up. And looks like the majority has it. Stored XSS or stored cross-site scripting. That is the most damaging type of, of cross-site scripting. Also, we refer to that as persistent cross-site scripting. Uh, an attacker uses stored cross-site scripting to inject malicious content what we call the payload into, uh, and most often that payload can be something like JavaScript code, uh, and it will inject that into a target application. If there's no input validation, then that malicious code will be permanently stored or persistently stored, in other words, to the target application within a database, as an example. So that means that anytime a user accesses that database, they are potentially affected by that because we were able to store particular code in there without having to maintain access to that. So great job. Let's check out our next question here. Question number 20. Which of the following is not a tool we can use for subdomain enumeration? Is it DNS dumpster, sublister, Hunter.io or NM Mapper. Subdomains are one of numerous structures that we want to be familiar with enumerating. And our time is up. Another tough one, unless you are pretty familiar with some of these tools that are relevant to CEH. And the correct answer is hunter.io. So when we're talking about enumeration, basically we're talking about trying to discover as much information as possible about something. Um, all of these are valid options for doing that, except for hunter.io. That is used for email address enumeration. And that will scrape for email addresses associated with a specific domain. So as an example, maybe you would put in cisco.com or microsoft.com. You could scrape the web for instances of anyone who has an email address with that domain. All right, let's take a look at our leaderboard here as we're rounding third base. And it looks like we have a new leader. Chad has jumped to the top of our leaderboard. You can see the Top five or six. Moving right along, we have five more questions left. Number 21, which common Python structure is shown 
in the image below. Is it a function? A variable? A Boolean expression? Or an operator? All right, time's almost up. And we see the answer is in fact a variable. Variables are containers that we use with Python for storing various values. Uh, variables don't have to be declared as any particular uh, variable type. In fact, uh, if you look at variable A, that is an integer. Variable B is actually a text string. So they can be either of those. And just to give you a look at if you actually run this Python program, let's see if I can give you a look at that. This would be the output. So let's say this was a, let me actually take my face off of here. Let's say that this particular Python script was called variables.py. And if we ran that, if we ran variables.py, we would get the output one and word because we used print to call those out. So great job there. All right, next question. What penetration testing technique is used to obtain information about a network service, including but not limited to its software name and version? Is it LDAP enumeration? SQL injection, banner grabbing, or reverse shell. And our time is up. And it is, in fact, banner grabbing. The majority chose banner grabbing. So the first step when we are penetration testing is we're planning, we're performing reconnaissance. And one of those reconnaissance techniques we might perform is something called banner grabbing. Uh, that retrieves a software banner. The banner is usually going to contain important information about a network service. And that could include things like uh, its software name and its version. So when we're talking about FTP, uh, web servers, SSH servers, SMTP servers, oftentimes if they still have their banner enabled, their announcement banner, that can expose vital information about the software they're running. Why is that important? Well, if we discover that they're running an outdated version of software, that allows us to specifically tailor a vulnerability attack against that. So that's why banner grabbing is one of the very important pieces when we're performing reconnaissance. Here is our leaderboard. And Chad is hanging in there at the top still. And we have three more questions left, so anything could happen. Lots of things can shuffle around. Let's jump to our next question. Which phase of an advanced persistent threat or an APT attack involves tactics such as installing malware or backdoors? Is it persistence, expansion, intrusion, or exfiltration? And our time is up. And the answer is persistence. So phase four is persistence. Uh, what, so when we're talking about an APT attack, there are certain phases to that. And the fourth phase is persistence. 
Uh, whatever methods or tools the attackers are trying to put in place, they're trying to evade security mechanisms like firewalls or IPS. And persistence is the main indicator of an APT. Uh, they want to effectively and quietly exfiltrate data from a target in an ongoing manner. So obviously they want to maintain ongoing access to the target. And that could be involved through malware or backdoors, all kinds of different tactics for that. Uh, again, they may even use devices that they're installing backdoors on that they may consider to be above suspicion. Uh, and what I mean by that is maybe there have been instances where folks have installed malware on routers or even printers in some cases, because how often are we scanning our printers for vulnerabilities? So, all right, next question. Which of the following is not a common category of components found in modern malware? So modern malware has certain components. Which of these is not one of those? The payload, a compressor, an obfuscator, or a dialer? About five seconds left. And time is up. And the answer is dialer. So compressor may be a strange term to you, but that is in fact one of the key components that is often found in malware. So let's go through these. The payload, of course, is the main piece of malware that's gonna contain the functionality to cause damage or to steal data. A packer, is also referred to as a compressor. Uh, that's also common. If you're uh, familiar with things like zip files, you know that they are able to compress data in a way so that the file size is smaller. And the same sort of compression is often used with malware to try and hide the actual size of the data and to make it easier to transmit over a network. Uh, an obfuscator means that we're obscuring something. We're making it unintelligible, hard to read. So uh, good network security does that through encryption. Likewise, encryption is a way that sometimes our, our malware is treated so that it can hide itself better. And of course, a dialer is not something we find in modern malware. All right. Let's move on. Last question. Which of the following is not a mandatory part of a penetration test report, which is not a mandatory part. The appendix, the attack narrative, vulnerabilities, or remediation steps. About five seconds left. And time is up. And it, an, another tricky one, unless you're very familiar with this, uh, it is in fact appendix. So the, the majority got it. Now, the appendix is an optional piece. It's not mandatory. Uh, when we're talking about, there's lots of places online that outline the proper way to document a penetration test report. The appendix can be helpful. We can include an appendix at the end where maybe we would include additional information about logging and reporting outputs from our tools themselves. Uh, but again, it's optional. Uh, so for example, if we ran a NIC2 scan and we export all the results, that's something that we might wanna put in the appendix. Everything else is considered to be a mandatory piece. An attack narrative, in other words, how you performed your penetration assessment, that's definitely something you want in there. The vulnerabilities you've discovered and remediation steps. A big part of performing penetration assessments is recommending things to fix the issues that you found. Okay, let's check out the final scores. See who came out on top. 
Oh, and we look, we did have a shift at the top. Looks like Biden's skull has won our online quiz. Great job. Great job to everybody. Thank you for participating. Awesome. I hope you had fun. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed the replay of our ethical hacking live quiz. Just as a reminder, if you're interested in the topics that we covered here, I would love to have you in my two week long ethical hacking live course. Some details about that, that you want to know about. What do you get when you purchase this? Well, you get 15 hours worth of live training over the course of two weeks. You get session replays and you get indefinite lifetime access to those replays available at any time. So if you can't make a live session, if you miss a live session, or if you simply want to review something that we've talked about, you always have access to those. And all of those videos are downloadable. You can download those for offline use if you want to save bandwidth, or if you want to take them with you somewhere that you may not have internet access. And of course, I include a practice lab walkthrough. I walk through free virtual tools that you can use to create your own home lab for ongoing studies in regard to certified ethical hacking topics. As always, there is a 100% money back guarantee. If you attend the first session and you decide, you know, this just isn't right for me, no worries. All you got to do is send us an email and we will refund 100% of your purchase price. We'll drop you from the course. So there's no risk at all involved. If that's something you're interested in, then I definitely hope to see you starting Monday, April 18th in our live ethical hacking course. Again, you can find information in the video description to sign up and to learn more about that. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again soon.